Well, good evening. I am uh, Mike Veneman. I'm one of the assisting pastors here, and I have the privilege to share the word with you this evening for the, the next few moments on this Mother's Day Eve. Um, I wish to add again my uh, gratitude and thanks for all the mothers out there, and hope this day has been a good reminder to all of you on how special each of you are, certainly to us, and I believe certainly to the Lord as well. And for this reason, I thought it appropriate to consider from Scripture a woman who proved herself essential in the, the lineage of Messiah, Jesus Christ our Lord. And that's a great distinction indeed. We easily think of Mary in terms of the messianic line of Jesus, and rightly so, for Mary is certainly favored among women. Yet other women and mothers of the Bible recorded in our God's Word, they hold important roles and places in the lineage of, of Christ as determined by our sovereign God and Father, who in His infinite wisdom determined through whom and how His Son would come into this world born of a woman. The woman I, I wish to focus on this evening is Naomi. Little, uh, little less known, Naomi, but, and the Scripture, of course, is in the book of Ruth. So if you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Ruth, and we're going to move quickly through the book, picking up passages here and there, which, uh, which support our focus tonight at looking at um, Naomi. And as we shall discover, Naomi was a wife, a mother, a mother-in-law, a woman of Bethlehem, and a grandmother. Her name, uh, Naomi, it means kindness or pleasantness. And one may ask at this point, well, why would we consider this woman whose name means kindness from Scripture? What can we hope to achieve by doing so this evening? Well, there's obviously something about Naomi to call, cause the Holy Spirit of God to include her in the eternal Word of God. And further, there's something about Naomi to cause a young woman, namely Ruth, to leave everything that she knew, everything that she had, and everything that she possibly had hoped for, to leave that in her homeland and follow Naomi altogether. Ruth left her home, her family, her people, the gods of her people, and she went to relocate with her mother-in-law to a foreign land where she may or may not be very well received. Now, these are qualities worth considering tonight, I believe, about Naomi that caused Ruth to desire to stay with her over all that she had known, and that speaks good, I believe, of Naomi. It's worth consideration. And what we can hope to achieve by considering Naomi is this lesson. I hope this is the lesson we learn. We should never, ever underestimate the power and beauty and, I might add, attractiveness of a simple life lived in kindness and obedience to God and service to others, no matter, no matter how great the difficulty that life encounters. Naomi was the wife of Elimelech and the mother of two sons, and with just that bit of information provide us, provided, let us read from the account from the book of Ruth in light of our consideration, and I'm going to start at chapter 1, verse 1, and we're going to read the entire book. No, I'm just kidding. But you know, well, that'd be great. Well, we'll, go th we'll jump through it. Stay with me. Ruth chapter 1, verse 1, Now it came about in the days when the judges governed that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the land of Moab with his wife and two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his sons were Malon and Kilion, the Ephrathites of Bethlehem in Judah. Now they entered the land of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech... Naomi's husband died, and she was left with her two sons. They took for themselves Moabite women as wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. And they lived there about ten years. Then both Milon and Kilion also died, and the woman were, was bereft of her two children and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the Lamb of Moab, and that she, for she had heard in the land of Moab that the Lord had visited his people in giving them food. So as we consider uh, Naomi tonight, 
um, be, uh, before we closely examine the, the, the account, I wish to state a premise as well that um, maybe this is just for me, just to help us as we're going along, our purposes. Where are we going with this? In other words, to answer the question, where are we going with this scripture? Well, I, I believe that our good God uses the beauty and attractiveness of a simple life lived in obedience to God and in service to others to reveal the heart and person of a mother to paint a picture in human history of his great sovereignty and his great plan of redemption through Christ Jesus for all mankind. So that's a mouthful. I know we'll leave it up there for a little bit to, for you to process that, but there's the premise. There's the direction that we're going. Notice as this account begins in the book of Ruth, we're given the historical setting in verse 1, and it's important. It's key to understanding, I believe, the movements of Elimelech and why he did what he did. We see that it was in the days that the judges governed. Now, we can conclude the reference to these days of Ruth were anywhere between you know, 1300 to 1000 B.C. in the time of the judges in Israel. Now, this is important information because it helps us understand why Elimelech did what he did. As recorded in the book of Judges, the days when the judges ruled or governed in the land of Israel, well, they weren't the best and the brightest for the nation, obviously. Their, their recorded in Judges it shows a, a cycle of uh, seven cycles, actually, of judgment and sin for and deliverance by God through the judges as the people did evil. The Lord would send them a judge to, to bring them out of their oppression and the, the people would have peace for a while, but then they would go back to the idols, and the cycle would go uh, around again. Later in the book of Judges, in chapter 17, we get clarity, and we read that there was no king in Israel, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. And the, the manifestation of what was right in his own eyes, it took on a lot of different form. Invariably, it was the worst sort of idolatry and all kinds of wicked practices, not appropriate for the children of the Lord, obviously. And for this, again, the Lord would give them over to their enemies, and they would plunder them. They would sell them into slavery and oppress the nation at every point. The people would cry out to the Lord, and the Lord would raise a, a judge up to deliver them, and they delivered them. They would have peace in the land, yet they would return to those idols and play the harlot once again with those nations whom they had already dispossessed. And this is the setting for what's happening in this very short book of Ruth. It's a, it's a horrible cycle of sin in the nation, and certainly one which would merit the explanation of why there was a famine. And now to read this contemporary account uh, in, in the book of Ruth, it's not so surprising to us that there's a famine in the land. I believe throughout history, uh, the history of God's people, and I dare say even today, the Lord has used the devastation of famine for His purposes. And in our account, and because of the famine of the land, certainly spiritually and physically, Elimelech, as the head of the family and provider, he determined to gather up his wife and two sons and move to Moab. Elimelech is a key person in this count, but we see very, relatively very little of him. His name means, my God is king. My God is king. By the way, that's, that's a pretty good name. If you want to use that, that I, I think, you know, the people are really stretching for names today. That's a pretty good one. My God is king. And his name, I think, should be taken in consideration regarding his actions to move his family at that time of, family, uh, of famine. With God as his king, he would understand, I believe, both the spiritual and physical ramifications of famine in the land and, and would have taken appropriate action. So he moved his family to Moab. And this may have been a difficult decision for Elimelech and for Naomi with him. She certainly would be affected by it. Notice with uh, the introductions of the family in verse 2, we're given the names of his two sons, and they have meaning as well. Elimelech and Naomi's two sons were Melon and Kilion. Melon meaning sick or sickly, and Kilion meaning pining or wasting away. Now, this is the case where you probably don't want to claim these names for your children. They're not so flattering. And there's much to be understood and said about names given in this time of history. The names were present indicators or hopeful future indicators of, the per of who the person was or would become. 
And the meaning of the sons' names, it, it helps us understand what the account records of their early death, but no other information is provided regarding that. And was it the famine in the land that caused them to be sickly and pining away? Possibly. For now, let's just focus on what we know about Naomi and her disposition and all of this. And again, this is our purpose for the evening. So we find Elimelech takes his wife and two sons and moves from Bethlehem of Judah to Moab. From Bethlehem, which means house of bread, to Moab, a place of a people who had literally been cursed of the Lord. Now, the irony of this is it, it's, it's too great to miss. The, the family was moving from the land of promise to a land whose residents had been cursed by God. Now, the reason for Moab's curse is, is detailed in their improper inception and continued in their contrary dealings with the children of Israel. The land of Moab geographically was 30 to 60 miles from Bethlehem, depending on the route the family took. Moab and the Moabites were descendants of an incestuous act by Lot's eldest daughter with her father as they fled Sodom and the destruction of that city as recorded in Genesis 19. The Moab, the name Moab literally means of his father, and this was their inception. As to their contrary dealings with Israel, Numbers 22 records one instance of how Moab, their king being Barak at the time, he hired Balaam, the prophet, to bring a curse against the children of Israel. You may be familiar with the account. Balaam was not allowed by God to bring that curse against the children of, of Israel and God's people. He was, however, able to provide a plan to Moab, which would break down the fiber of Israel and lead them into idolatry and immorality. And for this reason and more, Moab was cursed of the Lord. We may consider a moment, for a moment, just briefly, was moving to Moab a bad move on the family's part? Well, we, we don't rightly know. What we know is that there's much debate and, and reasons from both sides of this issue, but we not, must not allow the speculation of that to overshadow what is important in the book of Ruth. That is, the book of Ruth is a beautiful account of God's matchless grace and is laden with the meaning of redemption for us. Ruth, the Moabitess, believed on the Lord, and she was not only wonderfully taken care of, but she married Boaz and entered the royal lineage of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. While we want to learn what we can and discover the backgrounds of biblical events and draw spiritual lessons from those, we don't want this wonderful account to get lost in the debate whether it was right for Moab uh, for Elimelech to move his family to Moab or not. What matters is what God is able to do and does, how he overrules in the affairs of mankind and is consequently glorified in his purposes are done. I like as our pastor often says, and I quote him, uh, Pastor Damien, he rules over all and he can overrule all. So Elimelech moved to Moab. And Naomi went with him and their two sons. So then, how was Naomi used by God? For the next few moments on this Mother's Day, I wish to present some observations uh, throughout the book of Ruth of, of Naomi and how she was used by God in His plan of redemption, which I believe supports our premise. Notice, again, if you'll uh, start with me at verse 1 just for a moment, and we'll move quickly through, uh, we learn our first observation about Ruth, excuse me, Naomi. Naomi was willing to leave her home in Bethlehem to go to Moab with her husband. Now, that seems like a fairly simple observation, but I, I believe there's a lot going on there. The verse supporting that says, A certain man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the land of Moab with his wife and two sons. Now, this reads easily enough, doesn't it? It's like, just as a matter of fact, that's what he did. That's what happened. But moving from your home to another country is not easy. Yeah, moving from one house to another house in the same area is not easy. So, and the word sojourn, as it's used here, it means to dwell or to dwell for a time. So there was an intention explained in Elimelech's move. We can conclude that he planned to stay for a bit in Moab. 
And you know, again, just looking at this in the surface, I, I just wonder what those conversations may have been like between Elimelech and Naomi about moving to Moab. And I believe they had conversations and some serious conversations about leaving Israel, Bethlehem of Israel, and going to Moab. And uh, I, I don't know how Elimelech approached it, but if it's typically like we, we, we generally do as husbands, we we kind of stammer a little bit and say, so uh, Naomi, uh, what do you think about moving to Moab? And that, that would come over like a ton of bricks, right? And we would go from there. And well, Scripture doesn't record a conversation between Elimelech and Naomi over this move. What it does record in verse 2 is they enter the land of Moab and they remain there. Regardless of the difficulty incurred with such a move, Naomi moved with her husband and her children to another country, and this shows good character. And such a character in the midst of a difficult move, it would be reflected by another woman in the Word of God many, many years after Naomi, a woman we mentioned early, earlier, and that's Mary. You may recall from the Gospel account, specifically Matthew, that after Jesus was born, Joseph moved the family to Egypt. Then Joseph moved the family back to Israel, and instead of returning to Bethlehem, their hometown, Joseph moved the family to Nazareth. Now, we, we know from those gospel accounts that Joseph made those moves based on the word of the Lord, yet the difficulty of moving wasn't erased in the practice, I'm certain. But what we saw that Mary listened to her husband as he heard from the Lord, and she was willing to move, I believe, much like Naomi. Now, as the account in Ruth continues, we see that tragedy comes upon the family when they settle in Moab. And as we have read in verse 3, Elimelech dies, leaving Naomi with her two sons in a foreign land. And we're given then our next observation about her. We see upon the death of her husband, Naomi made good practical decisions for her family. Yes, she was left with her two sons, but they took for themselves Moabite women as wives. Now, being a, a widow in that day and age was the lowest and most difficult place in society. Being a widow in a foreign land in that condition could only multiply, I believe, that difficulty. Yet she had her sons still, and the most prudent thing she, to, to do was to have to her sons marry and produce children. And even if the children would be of Moabite women, her family's name would continue and they could go on. So the, the lesson that we can learn from the example of Naomi, even in this, is, in this observation, is that one can make good practical decisions even in the midst of despair, even the despair of death. Now, I, I don't by any means wish to convey in this observation a, a flippancy towards the heaviness and despair and the grief that death carries with it. Certainly, Naomi was mourning the loss of her husband, and, and she would continue to do so. Yet she was still able, by, I believe, her strength and faith in the Lord, to make decisions and determinations which were good and prudent going forward. For example, and in continuing our text, giving our next observation from verse 6, we see that Naomi knew it was time to go home. That's a good thing to figure out every once in a while. Sometimes it's just time to go home. She arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the land of Moab. With the death of her sons recorded in verse 5, Naomi was painfully aware of her bereft condition. No longer did she hold hope now that her sons would produce an heir for their father and their family and his name. That was done. That was over. All appearances held that she would be a widow without the joy of her children and without an heir for their family, which was very significant and important in this day and age. Heirs and the family name to continue was, would be a way that the family was sustained. So faced with further tragedy and death and loss, Naomi decided it was time to return to Bethlehem, time to go home. She was careful enough to inv investigate that the, the Lord had ended the famine in, in Israel. This shows an astuteness about her that can be appreciated. She knew what was going on. She was watching the times and she was listening. And this made, hearing this may have just been enough for her to say, yeah, it's time to go home. 
You may uh, recognize that phrase. I, I, it was Thomas Rule uh, about going home. It was Thomas Wolfe who wrote the book published in 1940, published after his own death, which holds the title often quoted even today. And it, the title is, You Can't Go Home Again. You can't go home again. Maybe you've heard that, or maybe someone has said that to you in reference. The idea being that once you have left home, you can never return to that home with it being in the same condition, nor could anyone expect the same way of life as you knew before. I believe Naomi likely had a keen awareness that upon returning to Bethlehem, things were going to be much different for her and much different for Ruth as well. And initially upon her return, uh, on her return that was certainly true. But her home would become something good, as the rest of the account records. Though she had lost her husband, she had lost her two sons in death, she had gained two daughters-in-law, and on the outset they determined to return to Israel together. Orpah and Ruth would travel with Naomi back home. Bringing her daughters-in-law to Israel must have been uh, done for more than just mere necessity. The, the book of Ruth reflects that she loved her daughters-in-law. They, she wanted them to be with her. She wanted to be with them, which brings us to our next observation, and this is based in verse 9 of the text. Let me read that. Uh, may the Lord grant that you be, uh, may find rest each in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. The idea being uh, uh, the observation, even in her sorrow, deep sorrow, Naomi thought of and cared for others. She, in telling them that uh, the Lord, she desired that the Lord to grant them husbands, she's telling them, hey, go back to your homes, go back to your mothers. You still have a life here in Moab. You don't have to come with me to Israel, uh, where the, the world will be in a very difficult and very um, trying situation. And our verse for this observation, it reflects that uh, conversation held in verses 7 through 14. Uh, and uh, talking about that, uh, that conversation they have, uh, again, a reflection of her care for the girls. Um, now, what, you, what we won't mention and what we will look at closely in, in this context is um, Ruth's response to her mother-in-law of her undying loyalty to her. To consider Ruth in this time, in this setting, we require another complete uh, study. So, Lord willing, we'll endeavor to do so maybe in the future. So with Orpah and Ruth in focus for the moment, we find that though her daughters-in-law, they, they certainly would have provided her safety and companionship on that journey, and in life going forward back in Israel, Naomi encouraged both the girls to go back to their mother's home so they, they would have the proper opportunity to marry again and have families and husbands and sons in Moab. Now this was a selfless act on her part. She could have required both to journey back with her in hopes, again, that they may, might marry a nice Jewish boy. That, that could happen. Uh, yet she gave them the option, and uh, she, she, she was looking out for them and their interests. She was very, being very Christ-like in this way as well. Philippians chapter 2, if you're familiar with the, the, the chapter, it's all about what it looks like to be Christ-like. We read in verses 3 and 4 of that chapter, Do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own interests, but for also for the interests of others. So the account records that uh, as she put this proposal to Orpah and to Ruth, that Orpah indeed, did indeed return to her mother's home, but Ruth, however, clung to her and stayed with her and traveled with her and lived with her. So at a time when Naomi, laden with grief and loss, could have thought only of herself and her future, going home, she was looking out for the girls and showed great character in this. This does not, again, mean that she was not grieving and sorrowful. This does not mean that she had it all figured out. It doesn't mean that uh, she didn't struggle as well. Which brings us to our next observation about some statements from Naomi in verse 20. Naomi changed her name based on what was not ultimately true. She said, for the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. The Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. The Lord has brought me back empty. The Lord has witnessed against me. And the Almighty has afflicted me. 
Five separate times as recorded in the account, Naomi expressed how she believed the Lord had forsaken her, how she was alone. And, and she asked to be called something that was outside her God-given name. Let me read that verse in verse 20 of chapter 1. She was speaking to the women that she came back to and, and found again in Bethlehem, and she said to them, Do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara, which means bitter, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. Was it true? The things that she had stated in these five statements, was it true? Had the, had the Lord forsaken her? Was Naomi premature and desiring a, a name change here? Though it may have felt as if the Lord had forsaken her, her statements were not proven to be true. Notice each declaration attributes her sorrow and pain to what she was feeling that God had done to her. Feelings can be so and are so deceptive. We must be very careful. And this is understandable, understandable on her part, but misplaced. An appropriate quote, uh, I believe, which could have been written with Naomi in mind, was found in a devotional. Actually, my wife Tracy supply, uh, supplied this uh, for me as I was looking at the study, and it, and it was very appropriate. It's in a devotional collection by Mary W. Tylston. Uh, the, the study is called Daily Strength for Daily Needs, and I'll read it for us. She writes, It is possible when the future is dim, when our depressed faculties can form no bright ideas of the perfection and happiness of a better world, it is possible still to cling to the conviction of God's merciful purpose toward His creatures, of His parental goodness even in suffering, still to feel the path of duty, though trodden with a heavy heart, leads to peace, still to be true to conscience, still to do our work, to resist temptation, to be useful through, though with diminished energy, to give up our wills when we cannot rejoice under God's mysterious providence. In this patient, though uncheered obedience, we become prepared for light. The soul gathers force. I believe a good application for us in light of this is that we need to be careful uh, to declare something about ourselves outside of what God has called us, just based on a time or based on a season. It is God who forms us. It is He who determines our way. It is He who gives us our identity. It is He who gives us our name. He does not forsake us. He does not leave us. The writer in Hebrews by the Holy Spirit told us in the words of Jesus Himself said, I will never leave you or forsake you. And with that truth in mind, let us take up our next observation of Naomi. Now in Israel, we see that Naomi began life again at home. Uh, at the end of chapter 1, that very short sentence there, easily overlooked, we see they came to Bethlehem, Bethlehem excuse me, at the beginning of the barley harvest. Now, this observation is, is contained in, that final, in the final words of verse 22, chapter 1. They, they seem an odd verse to use for the basis of an observation that Naomi went back home, but I think what we see in those words reveals much. Notice first there was a barley harvest. You remember before the condition of the land? Famine. So now we have a barley harvest back in the land. We see that yet the Lord's blessing had returned in bringing this harvest. Also, we see in that brief statement a future sustenance for Naomi along with her daughter-in-law, Ruth. With no husband, no sons to perpetuate the family and the family name, Naomi and Ruth came under the protection and the care of the law of the Lord. The first law was related to their sustenance and how they would eat, how they were, would survive. They couldn't just go home back to Bethlehem and set up shop, a nice little uh, candle shop and, and knickknacks and whatnot and, and sustain themselves. You didn't do that back then, although candle shop may have been nice. I don't know. Maybe they had the potpourri thing going. I, I don't know. It, it just wasn't done. They were not allowed to sustain themselves in that way. They, come, they came under the, the uh, classification of uh, widows and orphans for the most part, but they were not without protection. Since both women were w without a husband, they were reduced to a dependence upon gleaning of the crops which were being harvested. 
Old Testament law was very specific as to allow, allowing the, the less fortunate to be able to glean and sustain themselves. Regarding that verse, we found, it's found in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 19. It reads, when you reap your harvest in your field and you forget a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. God had written into law the provision He knew that would be needed by a significant group of His children. Just the mention of the season of the barley harvest has hope written into it by the Holy Spirit for Naomi and Ruth upon their return to Israel. The second law related to the situation was related to the continuation of Elimelech's name and his family. It's often referred to as the law of the Leverite. The law of Moses ruled that when brothers live together in a clan and one of them dies leaving a widow and has no children, the woman must marry one of the surviving brothers. And when she has had a son from that second marriage, the boy would be considered the son of the brother who, who died. And if a man died without father children, his name died too. And so the law was needed. The Leverite law pro provided a way around a, this dilemma, and it was also a way of keeping the family property intact. In if you're familiar with the book of Ruth, we know that uh, through, um, through Boaz, as this Le heeding this Leverite vow as a kinsman redeemer, redeemer, through what he done in taking and marrying Ruth, he also, uh, he also bought the, per the land of Elimelech, Elimelech as well. And so the family was sustained in the purchase of both. Um, the book of Ruth is to some extent a, an example, a very good, clear example of the Leverite law. Uh, though the, the love struck Boaz, he certainly saves Ruth and Naomi from their bereft state. But it's not just gallantry that, that motivates him. He's a kinsman of Ruth's dead husband and so ha has a responsibility to see that she's taken care of and certainly meets his responsibility. So the two return to Israel at the beginning of the barley harvest and with this in mind now moving forward through the, the short book let's consider our next observation and it's found from verse 2 of chapter 2 we see that Naomi supported and encouraged Ruth I just have a short phrase there it just says go my daughter uh, but there was a lot going on there if you'll uh, it'd be helpful to, to see the first verse let me read that for you now Naomi, Naomi had a kinsman of her husband a man of great wealth of the family of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, Please let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after one in whose sight I may find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. So notice Ruth is, is by the way, notice Ruth is no longer called Naomi's daughter-in-law. There's been a closeness and affection, I believe, developed here and is significant as to her love and support of Ruth. Naomi recognized their life as determined by the Lord and allowed Ruth to make a way for them. She allowed Ruth to realize that Old Testament law of gleaning and act accordingly in their situation. She allowed and encouraged Ruth to make the most of their life as they knew it. And this was a credit to her character. Her sorrow and her, her, her bitterness could have bled in and bled over into her dealings with her relationship with Ruth, but it did not. Uh, she was gracious in this. What else do we see of Naomi here? Well, what else can we glean from the next part of the text? I couldn't help it. I had to use that once, if you allow me. Notice in verse 20 of chapter 2, as we move through the rest of the book quickly, Naomi was not so bitter that she was uh, not able to recognize blessing from God. Stated there in verse 20, Naomi is speaking uh, now again to Ruth about uh, the kindness that Boaz had shown to her, and she said, may he, ble may he be blessed of the Lord who has not withdrawn his kindness to the living and to the dead. And again, Naomi said to her, this man is our relative. He is one of our closest relatives. So as Ruth is gleaning from the fields of Boaz among his, among his maidservants, Boaz directs that she be abundantly blessed and make sure that she's abundantly blessed in her efforts. She's taking in a, a significant crop for herself and her mother-in-law. She's doing very well. And Boaz has, I, I believe, at least two reasons for favoring Ruth. One, 
uh, is that Boaz was certainly impressed with Ruth, and he was keenly aware of Ruth's kindness to her mother-in-law, Naomi. And for this, she was literally making a haul in her gleanings, doing very well. And Naomi recognized it, and she attributed it to the Lord's favor on them. And so let's, let's grab an application from that. It's, it's often difficult and sometimes seemingly impossible to see a blessing in the midst of despair. But does that mean there's none there? Are they, are they completely absent? Is it possible to see blessing? I believe so. And to see blessing in the midst of despair is the plan and the purpose of our Lord for us. If you are in despair even today, please look for the blessing the Lord is providing. They are there. Excuse me. With Naomi seeing and recognizing the Lord is once again acting on her behalf, now she responds appropriately as well. And this is seen in our next observation found in uh, jumping over to chapter 3. <clears throat> Naomi knew it was the appropriate time for Ruth to marry again. Kind of important to this whole account, isn't it? She knew it was time for Ruth to marry again. She said there, my daughter, shall I, not, shall I not seek security for you that it may be well with you? Naomi is putting this together, and, and, she sought that, and she sought security for Ruth. Now, that doesn't translate well for us, but what she's saying, security is the sense that she's looking for uh, a marriage for Ruth. Uh, security equated to arrest, arrest in marriage or security in marriage as well. Naomi, she's been processing all that has been transpired between uh, Ruth and Boaz, and she's come to the conclusion, and rightly so, this man loved her. There seemed to be a question remained whether Boaz knew that whether Ruth was available to him as a bride. And so Naomi instructed as to how Ruth could remove all doubt and present herself properly to Boaz as a suitable bride. And that's contained throughout chapter 3. And Ruth did as she was uh, instructed, and Boaz responded in kind. The match was all but settled. They were in agreement about one another. There was one small issue known to Boaz, but unknown to Naomi and Ruth. There was another kinsman redeemer. He was actually closer to the family than Boaz, and the law held that he would have first right, and it was necessary for him to have first opportunity to redeem Ruth and the land of Elimelech uh, through the payment to Naomi. So the Boaz said he would get it figured out. He would sort it. He promised Ruth that uh, he would do so, and he would not rest until he did, uh, did so. And now, this had, a, this had the potential to be a huge problem uh, and a disappointment for Naomi and certainly for Ruth as well, yet they did not panic. Naomi did not fret. She did not declare once again that the Lord was against her and had abandoned her and, and when she was so close to redemption. She didn't make those statements that she had made prior. No, Naomi instructed Ruth to wait. She knew Boaz would not rest until the matter was settled. She was waiting on the Lord. And this reveals a great growth, I believe, in Naomi. She had seen the provident hand of the Lord working again on her behalf, and she was able to trust Him and to wait on Him. Another good example and an application for us as well. Recognize the provident hand of the Lord working in our lives and, and the lives of others uh, close to us, and then trust Him. There was another factor, I believe, in Naomi's faith in this situation, <clears throat> excuse me, and it's in our next discovery from the text, and uh, it's from verse 2 of, of chapter 3. We, we see overall that Naomi knew Boaz. She knew this man. Uh, she said there in verse 2, Now is not Boaz our kinsman with whom your maids were? She knew he was their kinsman. She knew his social status. She knew his family. She knew his name. Boaz, by the way, means fleetness or, or quickness. And she knew that Boaz loved Ruth. So in times of trouble, it's, it's imperative to know those whom the Lord has prepared to be of help and to service in that season for us. And from where does this knowledge come? 
It comes from knowing God and knowing God's Word. It comes from the direction of the Holy Spirit when navigating life by, by His Word. Naomi knew the, the only hope for her and Ruth was for a kinsman redeemer to come and to redeem them from their difficulty and their, and their hopeless situation. Naomi knew the, the Lord had made provision for her and for Ruth within His law given to His people. Naomi knew the law of the Lord. And this is the, the greatest and grandest truth, I believe, held in the book of Ruth regarding the kinsman redeemer. For found in the type of Boaz is Jesus Christ Himself. Jesus is our kinsman redeemer to save us from the desperate state of sin and death in this world and, and in our hearts. He is the only one worthy to purchase us back. You may recall in the conversation the two men had um, weeks back when our uh, pastor taught from Luke 24, the two men on the road to Emmaus, they understood uh, something about Jesus. They didn't get it all right, certainly, but they understood and had an expectation that He would redeem them. They wrote, we find there that we were hoping that it was He, that is Jesus, who was going to redeem Israel. That's a, this is the same sense that was held with Boaz redeeming uh, the land and Boaz redeeming Ruth. The Apostle Paul, he understood the sense as well, writing to the Ro Romans declared by the Holy Spirit, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. And to the church of Ephesus, Paul wrote, in Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. So then the, the greatest and the grandest truth held in the book of Ruth is regarding the kinsman redeemer. For found in the type of Boaz is Christ Jesus himself. Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. And like Naomi, the onus is upon us to know we have a redeemer who has done everything necessary to purchase us back from the curse of sin and law. For Naomi knew that the only way it would be well with Ruth is by her union with Boaz. She knew this was their only way to peace. She knew this was the way back to joy. And this is what is found for us in chapter 4 of this very short book. And it's our final observation from the book of the Bible regarding Naomi. Naomi knew joy in her grandson. Um, she, she, we stated there that a son has been born to Naomi. As the book of uh, Ruth concludes, we learn that Boaz and Ruth indeed marry and have a son. His name is Obed. Obed means worshiping. And with a kinsman redeemer in place and her grandson in her arms, and uh, if you're not a grandparent, you can only imagine what that is, but it's amazing having become a recent grandparent again. And so, uh, and having one grandson and now a granddaughter, but there is certainly joy there. The women around Naomi, they pronounced a blessing upon her. The blessing contains great joy for Naomi and great hope for the world as it holds, I believe, a prophetic truth of Jesus to come. It's so, it's so uh, appropriate. Let me read that from you in chapter 4, beginning in uh, verse 14. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a Redeemer today. And may His name become famous in Israel. May He also be to you a restorer of life and a sustainer of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better, than you, better to you than seven sons has given birth to Him. So Obed was born of Boaz, and from Obed was born Jesse, from Jesse was born David, and the lineage of Messiah to come was set. What can be our takeaway from this consideration of Naomi? A wife, a mother, a mother-in-law, a woman of Bethlehem, and a, a grandmother now, as we see. Well, for all the pain and suffering and, and loss known to Naomi, she remained available and obedient to the Lord. We, we should never ever underestimate the power and the beauty and the attractiveness of a simple life lived in kindness and obedience to God 
and in service to others, no matter how great the difficulty that simple life encounters. So in conclusion, just an encouragement for us today, tonight. Let us endeavor to live a simple life of kindness and obedience to God and and service to others, no matter how great the difficulty that life uh, encounters. And let us do so in the power of the Holy Spirit and in the truth of God's Word. As a reminder, like Naomi, your story is not complete. The Lord has not written the last lines of your life. What may be grievous to you now may be turned to joy soon. Uh, and I want to close with a very familiar verse to all of us, uh, but I believe appropriate according to what we saw in the book of Ruth. And we know all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. This was certainly true for Naomi, and it's certainly true for you as well. Let's stand together and we'll pray. Lord, we thank you for this, this short book of Ruth and that you've included in your eternal scripture and the eternal word of God and, and all the, the amazing truths that lie within there. I pray, Lord, as we've considered these things and, and even consider the life of Naomi, that we would be encouraged in our own lives toward that end, that we would not be discouraged with a, maybe a current or past circumstances. Lord, that we would be determined in, in our love for you and obedience to you through Christ Jesus, our Lord, our Redeemer, that we would live a life that, uh, that we can live and that's provided to us by the, the power of your Holy Spirit, Christ in us, living through us and in us, and the truth of your word. Lord, we thank you again uh, for your word and the time to share it uh, tonight. Uh, we pray that as we close this day, we do so in reflection of, of all that's been considered all that we heard from this morning, the, the worship that we offered and the worship tonight, the, the word that we considered. Lord, just give us a, those moments of reflection of your goodness, for you are good, you are sovereign. You do uh, overrule and rule over all, and uh, we, we glorify you for that, and we praise your name. And we're grateful for people for it as well. And so guide our steps as we go from here. Let us walk in the power of your Holy Spirit and the truth of your word, um, living a life that's uh, glorifying to you and a life that reflects the, the very person of Christ. And uh, may we be light and salt in this very dark and, and uh, unsavory world. And may it be an example. And may, may we be ready to give each man account uh, of the faith that is in us. Uh, Lord, we ask these things uh, again for your glory and for your kingdom. And we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.